Well, here we are back again for Deborah and Peter's podcast, which we're having a great deal of fun recording. So I'm Deborah Alcott-Tyler, and I'm here with my um, virtual and pretend twin, Peter Wanless. Peter, how are you? Yeah, hi Deborah. I'm um, I'm I'm fine, thanks. Slightly uh, slightly mixed feelings. Um, wearing my other hat as the uh, oh. president of Somerset Cricket Club, um, I'm reflecting on um, a season which promised so much and ultimately ended with nothing. Um, we might sort of talk on about successes and failures today. Um, uh, I think, um, and I've also been mulling over uh, all the stuff we've had, you know, week after week about gifts, hospitality, um, and all of that sort of stuff. And what's what does that look like in the charitable sector? So there's a couple of topics we might reflect oh, on. I'm yeah, sure you've got something to say about each of those. Of course, I do always. Plenty to say. But I, I have to say I do commiserate because, you know, I, I'm to, to listeners, you may not know, but both Peter and I are massive cricket fans. I'm a Surrey um, girl myself, and Peter's a Somerset boy, although way more important. You know, I'm just a, a supporter, whereas Peter's, you know, has mighty titles attached to his the name. President. Fact, president Peter won this, isn't it? So, um, but I'm so sorry that, you know, you lost to Glamorgan today. And I know you, you've been doing really well in the season, haven't you? What, what's happened, Peter? Uh, as we're recording this, uh, eight days ago, Somerset could have won every competition going in domestic cricket. And um, we're currently now reflecting on winning nothing. And um, it's a really interesting question for the club, I think, about does does that constitute success or failure? And how do you motivate people in those circumstances? How do you react as a leader or a supporter um, of, a, of a team? In, in, in many ways, everything depends on the silverware or the trophy. In, in in our world, everything depends on winning the funding pitch. Um, it's all very well coming second in a whole load of charity of the year pitches, but um, in the end, you need to win some. Um, on the other hand, um, in Somerset's case, I think we outstripped expectations in so many respects and have brought through so much talent and young players performing way beyond their Years there's there's lots to there's lots to celebrate. So as a, as as a leader, striking the right tone, um, that kind of determination um, uh, to win, um, but at the same time uh, wanting to praise and sustain the sense of team and the energy and the progress that has been made. Um, there are, there are, there are some echoes definitely. Uh, between Definitely, yeah. It and charity as well. yeah and charity because it strikes me a bit as well is that you know of course success it, a lot of it's down to hard work and practice both in charities you know and in sport and you know whatever form of life but I also think there's an element of luck I mean I think about cricket you know sometimes if you if you lose the toy cost that toy cost toy <laughs> coin toss if you lose the coin toss that can actually really change you know the nature of the game depending on the state of the wicket and stuff like that and I think that sometimes it's like getting that balance right isn't it between you know whether it's your your, your team and your charity about saying you know it was bad luck we didn't get that bid it's not because we're rubbish or that we're not a good charity or that we didn't work hard enough it was just on the day you know there were other factors at play that we actually couldn't really in influence and you know it strikes me that it's a bit the same with cricket it's not just about the hard work and the talent etc like sometimes the conditions go against you sometimes you know you've got perfect conditions for the first session and then the session after tea it's cloudy and darker and you know not not quite dark enough for the umpires to take you off and put bad light but nonetheless makes it a bit harder to you know so I think, so how do you get that balance, Peter? Like, yeah. especially thinking about it, it's interesting because you've got Somerset and, you know, all the staff as well as the players to motivate. And then, of course, you have the same sorts of challenges at NSPCC. You know, the, the, you know you've know, you had loads of successes, but also some failures. How, how do you manage it? Is it different between yeah. the two? There are similarities and there are differences, for sure. I mean, 
particularly with um, Somerset at the moment, when you get so close, but every time you just miss out at the last moment, that does cause people inevitably, I think, to ask questions about are they bottlers? Are they choking it? Because uh, quite a bit of the game is in the mind as well as uh, uh, the technique. Now, I, I definitely don't believe that for our team, um, but I'm sure they're at, they've have they will they will be asking themselves uh, that question. And in uh, charity, if you if you kept getting to the final three in competitive pitches, but never actually landed them. Or you had a success in them at the same time. Is, is, is that a pattern, or is it one of those things, but a different factor every time? You have to ask yourself the question, don't you, about um, not just the kind of um, the technical excellence of the case that you're making, but the um, the passion and the belief that you're um, uh, conveying. And I don't. I don't know the answer, and it it depends a great deal on who you are pitching to as well, doesn't it? In a kind yeah, of fundraising yeah. context, as to whether you have um, uh, judged them correctly. Um, I do. I think cricket's a very interesting sport in that it's a it's a sport where you need people who are individually excellent in what you do, but you also need really great partnerships, whether it's between two batters or between two bowlers you need a captain on the on the pitch who inspires um and these are all people related issues that in organizations like ours you have to think about as well don't you You need people who yeah. are absolutely excellent at what they do and on occasions you want your personal performance to be right out there but you also need people who can work with and through others and you need leaders who can inspire those uh, individuals to be at least the sum of their parts and and ideally more so um for, for for that reason there have been occasions this year where people have said oh somerset are a cricket team that they they aren't packed full of stars and international players uh like surrey but they're performing beyond expectations because of the leadership and how they're pulling together so i guess i'd like i'd like to feel that we are um achieving some of that in a in a charity context but uh i i, I, I don't know it's remind it's reminded so a little bit of this you can take stretch all this too far can't you it reminds me yeah. of a, a comedy sketch from sort of years ago about thought for the day on radio 4 where some rather sort of pretend pompous religious person was talking about how um uh, uh some fantastically important religious concept could all be taken back to how Spurs were playing in the midfield that weekend and uh, I don't know. There's always a football analogy somewhere isn't there but actually you know it's interesting you say that because I think you know coming back to the sort of losing funding business stuff like that I was having a really interesting conversation with Amy at Briar at the Pears Foundation and she was talking about funders giving feedback and we were we were basically agreeing that actually, so loads of charities, when they get rejected from funders, they demand feedback, like tell us why we were rejected. And of course, the thing is, is like having sat on grants committees, it generally is once you get past the, you know, what, what, you know once you're, you get past all the hoops and loops to get you in front of the committee, then on the day, it tends to be luck. You know, it's very rarely that one particular um, application is it's better in merits or it's a better idea or it's better put together than another it's very often other factors that come into play that you've got no control over as a charity for example there's a particular issue that's cropped up in the local area on that particular day or in that particular month which is affecting the the decisions that the trustees make and things like that and she was making the point that also often you're getting if you do get feedback you're getting feedback from a funder about them and actually, your yeah. next funding application is probably going to go to somebody else. So, so you'll be writing your application to XYZ funder based on what was feedback from pairs, and that pairs might have wanted something entirely different. So she was saying that she 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 wonders and she worries whether feedback actually is that useful. And I think, and also because feedback's kind of in the past, isn't it? I and mean, again, I, you know, coming back to cricket teams or any sporting team, I suppose, but cricket's the one that you and I love. 
is that you can feed back as much as you like about the performance in any particular one match or in any particular test series or whatever. But actually, it, it's no use unless you're translating that into something that somebody can do for the future. So just saying, like, you missed that shot or that was, uh, you know, so many wides, you know, that's, yeah, OK, I know, I was there, I felt it. You know, well, actually, that's not desperately helpful. And sometimes all yeah. it does is crush people yes. feedback. If you just end up yeah. feeling you're absolutely shit at your job and everybody thinks you're rubbish and what's the point? When actually what you need is, this was really great, more of this. Yeah. You know, I don't definitely. know what you think about that. Totally. Yeah, definitely. That that sort of constructive feedback and rather than sort of stating the obvious, um, you shouldn't have uh, missed that ball the first, first time it came straight at the wickets. Um, it doesn't, doesn't really... If, if, if you don't believe the players are hurting then uh really they are for sure probably um 10 times more than you are as a supporter and if they're not there is a deeper problem um yeah uh, for sure and, and on and on feedback more generally you know i have had feedback on a pitch that the nspcc hasn't got in the past we didn't give it to you because you are so visible we don't think you need the help these other people need it more and i've had yeah. feedback um we um didn't give it to you because uh you're not as visible as the other people who are clearly working much harder to get themselves out there so um yeah. you win and you, you, win, you win some you lose some and that and that is okay but if you're consistently losing some that's a problem isn't it and i suppose it's spotting yeah. those patterns that is the key I'm very interested in all this fuss about politicians accepting gifts and hospitality um, and whether it's the right or wrong thing to do. Uh, and I wondered if you had any thoughts about whether charity leaders should accept um, uh, gifts um, or go to events with um, uh, people who are offering the opportunity to see or experience this or that. I have some thoughts, but what do you think? Well, it's not really tough. So talking specifically for me about charities, it's a really tough one, isn't it? I mean, definitely not gifts. If someone's, you know, well, again, sometimes you can't control it because like when I go out and give my speeches to charities, you know, frequently I'll get a bottle of wine or a bunch of flowers, even though I say, please don't bother. I'd rather you bought one of our books. You know, I don't need the flowers and I don't need the wine. I definitely don't need the wine. So um, so putting things like that to one side, I definitely don't think gifts, but I think things like events, because of course, as a charity leader, you're always trying to network. You're always trying to send, sell your message. And if you get invited to things where you're going to be with other people who might have wealth, who might have contacts, who might have influence, and it's the sort of thing that you can't afford to pay for yourself and you will, and you definitely wouldn't expect the charity to pay for you to go to, you know, because whether we like it or not, it's still quite a male paradigm of a world of networking and things like that. You know, there's still an awful lot that happens when you go to events. And so I think that's quite that's sort of a difficult one, really, um, about that. You know, on the whole, I don't think we should. Well, although having said that, Peter, of course, the whole basis of charities is gifts. People gift yeah. us their money, they gift us their time, they gift us rooms, they gift us computers, they gift us, you know. So I suppose there's a distinction in the charitable world between a personal gift and a gift to the charity, which is going to help you to do your work and your business. But when it comes to other sort of sections of society, like politics and things like that, I think it's a little bit more complicated. I mean, if I'm really honest, I think there should be an absolute line, which is no gifts, you know, at all. But then again, how do you define a gift? I don't know. But, you know, I think that I think there is a, a real I, I think under the last government in particular, this real sense of, you know, people taking backhanders and getting things for free and just because of their position and stuff like that. And, it, and the public don't like it. And I'm not keen on it either. Yeah, um, when I think back to my yeah, when, I think, when I think about back to my time as a as a civil servant, there were quite strong rules about gifts. I mean, you did not accept yeah personal gifts and I think we've seen coverage in the past that when gifts are given to politicians if they want to keep them they're supposed to pay for them so you get these extraordinary examples of um, uh, I can't remember you know, one of the former Soviet republics um, gifting a horse to um, uh, oh the prime goodness. minister and uh, 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 very very expensive things which then 
uh, are given to the government, but if they want to be utilised personally by the recipient of the gift, they have to pay for them. And that seems fair enough to me. But I also remember, you know, back in the day, uh, I confess that I worked when I worked in the Treasury for a while, I worked on um, private finance and, and um, the government was trying to get um, private finance contracts and public private partnerships off the ground. And my boss at the Treasury was absolutely a performance indicator of mine and my colleagues. He expected us to be out there having lunch in all the banks across the city, pushing yeah. the importance of private finance and what the respective roles of government and uh, uh, and finance were, and I was expected to go and uh, uh, engage with the construction companies and, and and this sort of thing. And he did at the end of every month look at how many how many dinners and lunches I'd been to and accepted and the value that I'd 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 put on them. Because if I was simply sitting in the office theorising about what needed to be done, I wasn't uh, advocating and explaining the message. So I have a great deal of sympathy for particularly some of these um, shadow ministers who subsequently became ministers because they needed to be out there um, yes. selling and explaining um, the message. Uh, and if they hadn't been, then they're unlikely to have the same impact. Now, um, you do all of that uh, with your eyes open and part of what you're doing is expressing your message but also what you're doing is receiving stuff back isn't it and if you are yeah. naively um taking all of that at face value and imagining i must agree with these people as a consequence of them giving me a very nice lunch then you've got a problem yeah. but that's about sort of willpower isn't it so if i now translate that into the charitable um environment i would like to think that um when I go out or when we go out and are invited to lunch with all sorts of people or whatever it might be, we are doing that in an effort to further the charitable purpose, not in yeah. an effort to advance our um, you know, personal enjoyment of this, that and the yeah. other. Now, we've talked about cricket already on this podcast. Lots of people know I'm a big cricket fan and I get invited to lots of boxes to watch test matches with these people and those people and and I never accept them because um uh come on if we want to have a conversation yeah. about our mutual interests we don't need to do that over seven hours of cricket in a box yeah. with you know uh, uh, uh 25 hey, other people so it, it, these things there are there is nuance in all of this yeah and I can't pretend any of us always get it right but with so many of these questions when you're thinking about things in the in the charitable sector can i derive benefit for my charitable purpose as a consequence yeah. of this activity and if and if, it, yeah. if there's a chance of doing that then why not you know go for it it's always amused me how often the outside observers see a, you know a fundraiser a major event fundraiser or a high net worth um you know a fundraiser um, or the chief executive or senior directors going off to like various awards and dinners and all the rest of it and thinking it's a jolly. And I have to say, I very rarely ever enjoy any of them. It feels like work. I'd much rather be sat at home, you know, watching the telly curled off my sofa than schmoozing with a whole load of people, some of whom I'm fairly sure don't like me. So it is funny how there's a perception that, oh, no, she's off again in a posh frock off to this thing, having a wonderful yeah. time. I mean, you can't get pissed. You can't relax. You're on parade. You know, there's, there's, somebody's going to say, did you see the chief executive of DSC or NSPCC, you know, rolling about the floor? So you can't mm. really relax at these things anyway. So it's quite interesting. But I sat on uh, Stuart Edlington um, when he was at NCBO, set up, I can't remember, about 10, 15 years ago, a commission on expenses in oh, charities, yeah. actually. And there was quite a lot of outrage at the time about how much was spent. And I went in with a very black and white view about, you know, what was right and want, wrong. And there was this issue that came up about the chief exec of an international NGO who was flying business class, not economy. And on the surface of it, that's outrageous, what a waste of charitable funds. Yeah. But actually, when we dug into it, we realised that this person was visiting five different countries in 10 days, all in different time zones, all over the place as yeah. part of this sort of campaign they were doing. And actually... If that individual had been forced to go economy, they would have been useless. They 
worked on the play because lots of those flights were like eight, nine, ten hours long. They couldn't have worked on the plane in an economy because, firstly, you, there's no room to work, and secondly, also, you know, you don't want people peering over and seeing what your your you know what the, you know your charitable yes. income or whatever it has to be. And also the fact that you'd be absolutely shattered when you got there. And I started to think quite differently about it then. I thinking actually there are times when it doesn't make sense for the charity not to spend money in that way, for example. And you get the same, of course, with you know the amount of money we spend on fundraising events and dinners in particular. And people say it costs this much for that. But the reality is, is that there are lots of donors who don't donate unless you invite them to a thing where they can bring a partner or some of their staff or what, or what have you. So it's it's just simply much, much more nuanced in my experience than the whole this is a good yeah. thing and this is a bad thing. Yeah, I had a, um, uh, I, I don't get, I get almost no international travel um, at, at the yeah, NSBCC, exactly. but I did have a, um, uh, a trip to the States earlier, United States earlier this year, and my chair said to me, you can go, but only on condition that you fly business class. Um, yeah. And, and, and I said, um, I'm going to go, but I'm only going to go on the condition that I fly economy because um, I, I cannot, it pains me to see the difference in the price and the money yeah, that, crazy. that, that, yeah. that, could, um, that the NSPCC could use with the difference between the prices. And in the end, we sort of compromised and I went premium economy um uh at the front you know with a little bit of extra leg room and and, and yeah. there we are i might feel differently if i was flying you know eight countries in 10 days or whatever it might be um the other personal reflection i've got this is all coming back to me now is um in the early days of when i first got to know you and i was the chief executive of the big lottery fund um, yes i made a point of going out and about and visiting lots of charities of all sorts of different sizes Ooh, so that I could put myself everywhere I the... went there you were <laughs> <laughs> so I was trying to put myself in all sorts of people's uh, shoes so I wrapped up quite a travel and subsistence uh, bill because you're covering the whole of the United yeah. Kingdom and that then became a story I think in the Sunday Telegraph about you know fat cat uh, chief executive has and it, it wasn't what I say it was it was I can't remember 14,000 pounds in a year or something or other, and all these numbers are very dated. But it was, a, you know, I suppose it was a reasonable amount of money. But when you divided it by the number of charities I visited and the need to be in each of the four nations and uh, each of the English regions, it, it, it actually wasn't a great deal. And it was really lovely oh, yeah. that some of the small charities said, uh, I mean, if, if, if I try and justify that, um, no one's going to be at all interested. But if the beneficiaries of the funds are able to say, well, we'd rather have someone running this organisation that has the slightest, at least a modicum of understanding about what it feels like to be yeah. out here, then it's a it's a price worth paying. So, um, And I remember it, Peter. I remember it well. Yeah. And it was fantastic. It was so well received by the sector. It was so well received by the charities you went to visit. Visit, you, you know, you turned up at loads of places, and you know, sometimes people genuinely weren't expecting it. It was like, you know, and I know they used to go to a lot of effort, you know, because I know some of the behind the scenes stories of the places you went. Where you know, I don't know if you're aware of this, but you almost like for them were being treated like royalty, like oh, yeah. everything up, you know, really smart, so he thinks we're spending the money well, you know. So it's like it must have been quite an odd thing, but it was a fantastic thing to do, and it was unusual as well because typically you know we haven't had that level of engagement yeah. of you know we've often, we've often found that you know again with the charity commission I mean David and I think Helen before but you know David the new chap is really trying to get out and about and go and see people and you know make it be known I'm a human being here so I remember it vividly at the time but, and it was an incredibly but, impressive thing to do but of course what happens is it gets misinterpreted doesn't it yeah it makes you you know reluctant to uh, to act in that way and it, and, it, and 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 probably suppresses the level of um engagement yeah engagement. don't realize uh, is it feels personal it feels like when people are attacking you for doing your job basically and doing the things you're supposed to do but it's costing money in order to do that which it does because there's no way you should have to pay for that stuff yourself um if it's costing you money to do it then it sort of feels like people are maligning your personal values or your integrity or your ethics and things like that. And so it does put 
you know, us in quite a difficult position, I think, much less so for me, because nobody really cares about what I do at DSC, you know, but obviously in the roles in which you're in, there's so much more high profile, particularly with the general public, that people are watching you constantly. They are. Um, we, we both buy our own clothes, I assume. Yes. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. But to be fair, if someone was to gift me a Vivian Westwood frock for, you know, dinners, I would be. I would say no, but I would have to fight with myself really hard, Peter. You know what I mean? I would like that. Would that would be an internal battle if I was gifted something really posh? But no, of course, you know. Yeah, I don't know, but I think I. Some, I wonder, you know, because this, of course, is going on and it will rumble on for ages. But it sort of feels like it's taking up far too much airtime when there are so many more critical things to be. You know, I think the point has been made. You know, I hope that they're now going to do something about it. But it's kind of like this relentless sort of, you know, admit you're awful, admit you're wrong, admit you're whatever. And I find it quite wearing, to be honest. But anyway, that's an yeah. aside. Just glad I'm not in that position. Yeah, it's it's consistency of standards and messaging, really, isn't it? And um, uh, there are some people who are going to be out to get you when you're in visible positions of, of leadership for sure yeah I, yeah I think you have to you know I I've learned over time you know when I first started out in leadership I very much tried to mold my you know early 80s I tried to mold myself how I thought leaders were and all the most of the leaders I knew were all men who wore suits and so I was very much one of those power dressers mm. you know big shoulders suits you know that sort of thing and I tried to behave differently as well and it just, you know, it, it, it kind of, I suppose it worked to a certain degree, but I just felt like just I wasn't myself. And then gradually, as I got more experience and older, I just realised it's pointless trying to pretend to be something I'm not because it's not working. You know, it's making me unwell and, you know, and I'm leaking all over the place, you know, because it's fairly obvious. So, And there was a, this moment of great relief when I suddenly realised and actually it was after I came to DSC because when I first came to DSC, you know, I was trying to act like a chief executive, like how I thought chief executives acted. And then I realised very quickly that just was not working at all. So in the end, I thought, sod it, I just got to be who I am. Yeah, and it's yeah. such a relief when you are, but then you have to accept the fact that when you're who you are, I mean, you've got to be sensitive and obviously, you know, change the way you approach people. So I'm not saying like, here I am, and if you don't like it, tough, because that's not good leadership. You know, you do adapt and you, you adjust your behaviour to the people and the circumstances and what's going on at the time. But in terms of your sort of core, who you're being, um, and then you have to accept that, you know, some some people are going to respond really well to that and some people aren't. You know, and I wrote an article a few weeks ago, I think, where I was making the point that some people think I'm great, some people think I'm awful. Who do I listen to? You know, who's right about me? Is it the people who think I'm great or the people who think I'm awful? You know, and so, and in the end, you just have to look in the mirror okay. and say, what do you think about yourself? Do you think you're yeah. doing okay? And are you trying to be a good person? You know, and at the end of the day, that's all we can really rely on, I think. Well, it's the, it's the people who think you're great that are correct, of course. <laughs> um, but just sort of, what, just one final um, story for now on um, on on dress sense. And it's, it's yeah. a, anything goes in a way these days compared with, how things work, yeah. I think, doesn't it? I mean, there's more space and scope to dress as yourself than perhaps there has been in, in, in previous years, um, to the point where I went to a meeting uh, a few years back, um, probably just before the lockdown, at uh, Buckingham Palace, and I uh, wasn't wearing a tie. And you still, um, to go into Buckingham Palace to have a meeting with a member of the royal family, need to wear a tie and in this little ante room before you go in they have a couple of ties um and so whatever shirt you're wearing they give you one of these to to put on so i put on one of these ties and we all went up and uh, our patron and president is uh, sophie now the duchess of edinburgh and she's she's quite fun and uh, uh, i have got to know her reasonably well but as i sat in this meeting and I saw her sort of scanning the people around the table, I could absolutely see that she knew I was wearing one of those ties that she'd seen probably 20, 30, 40 times before, worn by different visitors to, to Buckingham Palace with shirts that they didn't match whatsoever. So there are still a small number of places where you're expected to dress in a particular way and 
and that's one of them. And on, on that particular day, I failed my, the test. Yeah, presses all my buttons, Peter. And in fact, we're running out of time for, for this week, but maybe next week I can like wax lyrical and launch at you and lecture the world about my views on gender-based clothing and also particularly on clothing conformity that men are forced into. But not now, because I think we've run out of time, Peter. All right, well, maybe we'll start there next time. Maybe, maybe uh, we'll do that next week next week's podcast that was great um, fun and again right. massive commiseration commiserations i know especially as the president and it's bad enough as a supporter but when you're sort of the figurehead at the top it must be tough and next year next season peter you'll nail all of them i guarantee it let's hope so come on yeah. Somerset. thanks okay. everyone yeah all thanks right. for listening everyone see you next time <laughs> Thank you.